Welcome to this event at the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center. Uh, bienvenidos, welcome uh, to the Afro tradition environmental racism in the black placing in Mexico. Uh, this event is part of the Black History Month activities here at California State University in Nordridge and is sponsored by the University Library, the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center, and the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center. Support for this event was provided by the Diversity and Innovation Grant from the office of the president at CSUN. I want to thank a few people who made this event possible. Steve Coutte, who kept us organized and made all these remote events possible. Uh, technically, I think is that really hard stuff to do and he was able to show the film um, with a lot of uh, trouble, right? Because we're not Netflix. I want to thank also Isabel Ramos at the University Library and obviously my colleague at the Bradley Center, Keith Rice, uh, plus the wonderful team that we have at the center, uh, Wendy Spence Christie, Marta Valier, uh, Guillermo Marquez, and Zina Munoz. A special thanks to Jennifer Liu in the journalism department who made all the uh, bureaucratic uh, stuff happening. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Benavides. I'm a journalism professor and director of the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center. At the center, we have over 1 million images that document the social and cultural and political lives of the diverse communities of Los Angeles and Southern California. Our archives contain one of the largest collections by African-American photographers west of the Mississippi. We also have collections of the farm workers movement, Central America, Colombia's Palenque de San Basilio, um, Mexico and the, U the US Mexico border as well. Uh, we decided to screen this, this film, Jamaica and Tamarindo, y Tamarindo, and invite the director of the film, Ebony Bailey, to help us connect with Black history and, as Latino and Latin American history. According to the Pew Hispanic Center, one out of every four Latinos in the nation, 24%, identified themselves as Afro-Latinos. This percentage is similar to the percentage of Afro-Latin Americans in uh, obviously in that region, which they amount to 130 million people. You can see now uh, Ebony's bio in the slide that we prepared from you, for you. Uh, obviously she, uh, she's a, a, an emerging uh, uh, filmmaker that is done really wonderful work. And obviously she studied at the UNAM at the Mexican University, National Autonomous University in Mexico, which I am also an alum from, uh, but she studied at the University uh, Center of Cinematographic Studies uh, is known as CUEC in Mexico. And it's a, it's a wonderful place that has produced a whole bunch of uh, wonderful filmmakers. So I'm assuming Ebony, Ebony's career is just taking off and I'm sure we will see more of her stuff uh, later on. Additionally, we invited two young scholars, right, historian Jason Porter and anthropologist uh, Yoali Rodriguez, to help us provide a little bit of a larger context about Afro-Mexicans, Black Mexicans, Mexicans or Afrodescendientes in the Costa Chica re region, where some of the people that you saw in the film interview by Ebony Bailey came originally. Uh, in, in Mexico, and people just, uh, in some cases, are Mexican, so people deny this history, right? Uh, in Mexico, about 200,000 or 250,000 Africans really were kidnapped by Europeans and enslaved in Mexico during the early colonial times. Uh, today, we have, the, the country has about 1.38 million people that identify as Afro-Mexicans or Blacks which is 1.2% uh, of the population. And there are more than 200,000 uh, Afro-Mexicans in Mexico City alone. Um, we clipped this map, this recent map that Jason circulated through social media and that displays the percentages of Afro-Mexicans or, Af or, or Black Mexicans by state in Mexico. And you, as you can see, Guerrero and Oaxaca the two states in the, in the Pacific coast that are uh, sort of a color with, with uh, stronger colors are the states with the highest percentage of people self-identify as Afro-Mexicans, 8.5% in Guerrero 
and 12.7% in Oaxaca. This is where Costa Chica uh, is uh, uh, located, right? It's located in both states. So I would like to, uh, to have Ebony now uh, with us and ask her, I'm going to ask her a few questions. Please, please feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat for her. And I'm going to put also in the chat uh, the Bradley Center website in case you want to go and visit and see a little bit of our collection. So, Ebony, uh, thanks for being with us. I'm going to ask you the most obvious questions because obviously we are. Uh, most of my students that are here in this, in this Zoom are journalism students, right? So we have to, we like to know just the, ba the most basic stuff so people can understand uh, what's going on. Thanks for being with us. And obviously uh, the first question will be, why did you choose this topic for your documentary? And what did you, did you want to accomplish? What do you want to accomplish by, by doing this film? Hi, uh, thank you, Jose Luis, for, first of all, for inviting me, um, and thanks everybody who came. It feels like an honor that so many people are here and, and watching and listening to all of us. But um, the reason why I chose this topic uh, was because, well, I guess there's like a few reasons. <laughs> Someone's, um, who, uh, yeah, okay, so her microphone's on. But, um, so I thought of this talk topic initially after filming my first film, no worries, <laughs> after filming my first film, um, which is on Vimeo, and it's called Life Between Borders, Black Migrants in Mexico, and it focuses on um, Haitian migrants in Tijuana, and also um, Africans who settled in Mexico City and their children. Um, and one of the children that was in that film is Seina, who's also in this film, and she's the cook. And so when I met Seina and I kind of learned more about um, the ingredients that she cooks with, and she always would say that she cooks with tamarindo and hibiscus para hacer su, oh, sorry, to, to make her, um, to make her Senegalese dishes. And I was just like, oh, these are also dishes that are really common in in Mexico and so I already knew from going off of that first film that I wanted to make my master's project uh, about like the Afro uh, roots in Mexico and I think it also just comes like with my own personal identity of identifying as Blacksican which is different it's a different context than being Afro-Mexican uh, which is being like in a diasporic African that's born and raised in Mexico in my case I'm my dad's family is African-American and my mom's family is Mexican. So it is a different context, but I do still feel a fairly strong connection with Afro-Mexicans. Um, and so just going off of that, I knew I wanted to, to explore the topic in a deeper sense um, and explore it in the sense of like history and people who have made place in Mexico since the beginning of the country's founding. Whereas with the first film, it was more about migrants. Um, and so I already knew that I wanted to do that. And then I was talking more with Sena about her interest in food. And I was also talking to my friend Leona, uh, who's also in the film. She's the one with the braids. When I met her, I met her like as I was just uh, researching for this first film, like in the beginning of my master's program. And we were just talking and we both like food. We're both vegetarians. So we're, we just talk about like recipes and stuff all the time. <laughs> and um, and she was telling me that, did you know that La Flor de Jamaica is from Africa? And I was like, I did not know that. Um, and so after she told me that, like that night, I kind of went into the rabbit hole of looking into the history of La Flor de Jamaica and like the different places where it was. And it started making sense to me why Seina would use these ingredients for her Senegalese dishes. Um, and so I think from there, I knew I wanted to, to do something on on La Flor de Jamaica, the hibiscus flower, the Jamaica flower. And I didn't even realize that Jamaica and hibiscus were the same thing until I, until I started researching for this, <laughs> for this documentary. So, so I still was like, I had like this huge idea of doing this like grand documentary that, that touched a lot of topics like family, food, music, migration and all this stuff. But it was like really broad and I wasn't really like centered in the 
for my first year in my master's program, this is how the project was. It was very broad and I wasn't that centered with it yet um, until my third semester, one of my classmates uh, kind of works for like a secretariat, like a secretary, like a cultural secretary in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. um, and he was saying that there, there was an, like a, a grant, a small grant for projects that um, any kind of project like a workshop or audiovisual or anything like that, that had to do with indigenous culture or with Afro culture. And he asked me like, aren't you doing your project on something with Afro culture? And I said, oh yeah. He's like, what is it about? And I, like, and I was like, I don't know. It's about all these different things. And um, and then I mentioned to him about La Flor de Jamaica, the Jamaica flower. And he said, oh, you know, Tamron is also from Africa too. And I think that was like the first time that I had heard about also Tamron being from that continent. Um, or maybe I had just learned recently, but it was it was like just fresh in my mind when he mentioned it. And so he he actually suggested my my classmate um, suggested why don't we call the the audiovisual thing that you do for this small grant Jamaica and Tamarindo, and then you can just kind of use the money you get from the grant to focus on other parts of your thesis project. <laughs> and so. But when we when we called it Jamaica y Tamarindo, I think I just started like focusing more in on that. And it just kind of helped me like center really what the film was going to be about. Um, so from there, I chose the people who I interviewed and the people who I interviewed, I guess this is probably, I studied journalism too in undergrad. And I know that this is probably like a cardinal sin in journalism to interview your friends, but everybody in the, in the documentary are my friends. <laughs> and um and I chose them specifically because of how they represented diverse uh, Blackness and also how their interests were diverse. And what I mean by diverse Blackness is that they're all from, they're all live in Mexico City, but they're all from different places. Um, like Sena, she's born and raised in Mexico City, but her dad is from Senegal and her mom is Mixteca, Indigenous Mixteca from Puebla. And um, Chai and Suri, the musicians, they're born and raised in La Costa Chica and they migrated to Mexico City. And um, Leona is born and raised in Mexico City. Her parents were also from Mexico City and her grandparents were from Michoacan. So her um, kind of Afro descendencia, her Afro descendant, what's her, well, how do you say that in English? <laughs> um, her, her Afro roots are just from like another part of Mexico that you don't really even hear about that much. And Marbella is born and raised in Mexico City, but her parents are from La Costa Chica de Guerrero. So she also has the like dual identity. Her identity kind of reminds me of my own or kind of people who are Mexican American whose parents are from somewhere else and then they were born and raised in the US. Um, and so they have that like, that like dual identity going on. And, and I it was really important for me to represent that diversity and also like, diversity in gender, gender expression, sexual expression, and all that stuff. Um, just to show, because I feel like, especially in Mexico, where black Blackness is such a quote unquote new topic that because people are just now learning that Black people have been in Mexico since the beginning of the country's existence, I think there is like room for people to just put everybody in one box and think everybody is the same. And so I, it was really important for me to make sure that their blackness was represented, the diversity in their blackness was represented and the diversity of their interests. And what I mean by that is that Sena was the cook. And so instead of, you know, trying to go to Senegal and show the difference that way, Sena was a good person to like mediate the, the ways that Mexi Mexican ingredients are used to cook African dishes and vice versa. Um, and then Chai and Suri were the musicians. So they, they were able to show kind of the music element of it a lot of the music I think most of the music or all of the music in the film is played by them and um Sena or sorry Leona is a poet and I wanted to use her poetry to like interlude between the <clears throat> the different scenes and Marbella I actually met Marbella uh, after I had edited the first version for the the Mexico City office um, but when I met her and we became friends and she would tell me like anecdotes about her stories with her cousins with um, Jamaica y Tamarindo, like making it or playing with it and stuff. And so I asked her if she could, if she could participate for the longer version of the film because I thought her stories were really, were really just cute. <laughs> um, 
Um, and that's basically how I came up with it and kind of where I went with like the, the people who are in the, the movie and stuff like that. How has the movie been received in Mexico as compared to the US? Because you've screened it in Mexico and now you've been screening it in, in the US as well. Have you seen a difference? Is it similar? Um, that's a good question. I feel like there's, I feel like it's different in the sense that in the US it's usually screened with like niche audiences, like people who are studying either Mexican American, Chican, Chicanx or, uh, or like Afro studies, or it's just like in kind of cultural centers that are like geared towards these audiences, like POC, BIPOC audiences. Whereas in Mexico, um, sometimes it's just been public, like public, <clears throat> it's been in like public photo, public forums that are hosted by the, the city of Mexico City. Um, and so it's like anybody can just come and, and watch. And, and I remember before pandemic times, I had a screening in, um, El Faro de Tlahuac, which is like a cultural center in Tlahuac, which is a neighborhood that's like really far off. <laughs> well, it's far from for where I live because I live more centric. I live kind of more towards the center, but um, it's like very southeast. Yeah. And, um, and I really liked that screening because I felt like it was a lot of people who are just residents of that area and also residents uh, who would go to a huerto, like a senior home and like in the garden that's in the senior home. So it was a lot of seniors and it was just cool just listening to them hear about kind of either that they had heard about it or that their grandparents were Afro or things like that. Um, and then they didn't know about that route or they didn't know how to, what to call it. Um, and so that was kind of cool just hearing hearing about that. And and even in, in, in the US, there was one time where this is like a, cool or I like this story because it was I screened the film in Fresno and this is also before pandemic I had I had been screening the film for like two months um live before the pandemic started and in Fresno that's really close to where I'm from uh it's like an hour away from where where I'm from so that was the closest that I've, I had ever done a screening to my hometown and my parents came and all that but what there was one woman who was kind of elder and she and she was saying that she had a friend get, her friend was like super, super dark. And she was from Guerrero, this, this woman. Mm -hmm. And her friend was really, really dark skinned. And people would always ask about her friend and ask if her friend was African. And she was saying, no, my friend's not African. My friend's Mexican. And then she said, but after watching your film, like I can tell people that my friend is Afro-Mexican because she's also from Guerrero. And so that was just like really heartwarming for me to hear that like she, and then she started following the film on Facebook um, and all that was just like really heartwarming to hear too. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I think it's been, the reception in general has been like positive in both areas. Um, and in Mexico it's also been in like niche spaces, but I do feel like it's been also just in like more general public spaces because it's like hosted by like the, like the Secretary of Culture in Mexico City and stuff like that. Whereas in the US it definitely has been in like Latino film festivals, Black film festivals, or, or like hosted by the Office of Diversity and things like that. So it's, it's more niche. Thanks for answering that question. Let me ask you just one last question before I open it to the public to, to ask their questions. I already see some students already posted their questions on, on chat. In the chat, please do so. Um, how would you describe a Costa Chica for somebody who hasn't been there? I mean, uh, many people, even people in Mexico, have never been in Costa Chica, right? I know that you learned through that space through your documentary. How would you describe the place, uh, Costa Chica? Hmm. Well, I've been there. I'm also interested in hearing what, especially Awali has to say too, because she also studied in Costa Chica. But we'll hear about that when she when she talks about it. But I've been there three times. And um, this last time I went, I went to film and I went with my friends Chai and Suri who are from Born and Raised in Costa Chica. So it was really cool to film with people who are from there and not just, I don't know, not just like, like arrive and kind of feel like a colonizer in that sense, but yeah, to like actually collaborate with the community in there was really important for me. It would just have been weird to just go and take a, and take a 
film and take pictures of people who I don't know. But um, but I think I would describe it when the first time I went, I remember thinking that it was very beautiful, like scenic, very, very beautiful. I felt like at home um, because there was just so much blackness, but I also felt, I definitely, I felt at home and I felt like a lot of people a lot of people either thought I was from there or they knew I wasn't because I guess I do still phenotypically look slightly different than um, most people who are in La Costa Chica. And and uh, I would also say that my first impression was that it was very remote. I don't know if remote is the right word, but it, um, in the sense that like there's not great connection to the internet. You know, La Costa Chica is one of also the one of the most like socioeconomically lowest areas of Mexico too. And I think that also plays with like systemic racism. Um, and so I also don't want to like romanticize like the very real struggles that happen there, but but uh, everybody is super nice and super hospitable. Um, there's one other story I have where I was at a like a restaurant and this woman, uh, Afro-Mexican woman came up to me. She said, De donde eres negrita? Like, where are you from? And I said, oh, I soy de California. And she's like, ¿A poco hay negros en Estados Unidos? Like she said, oh, there's black people in the US? <laughs> and then I told her like, that's funny because people think there are no black people in Mexico. And then we just laughed. <laughs> but, but it was funny that that was just like a funny story of like, wow, I didn't even think that people wouldn't even associate black people with the US, but yeah. <laughs> I, I asked you that question because obviously we have in Cal we're in California, we're in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles re region is a receptive receptor of uh, uh, people that migrated from Costa Chica, right? So we have uh, people from Costa Chica here in Pasadena, Santa Ana, Oxnard, and other places of the uh, of the Los Angeles uh, area. And I see now people are starting to post their questions, so I'm going to shut up and then and then start looking for their questions. Uh, the first one is by Andres Soto, and I think he's asking about the concept of community and belonging and how that plays a part in uh, someone's identity. Uh, was that something that you set out to show from the beginning, or did it gradually come up to uh, while you were making the documentary? Um, I think that's something that I tried to show in the beginning. Everybody I interviewed knows each other, um, though we interviewed each other at different times and everybody has met each other at some point in like some black or Afro space in Mexico City. And so I think that that kind of just shows like how we're all searching for a community. And in my case, I grew up here in Port, I'm in Porterville right now and the, for the longest time that I've been since moving, like. 15 years ago, I think, but um, but Borderville is very Mexican American. Very uh, a lot of migrants also come here and work in the fields. My grandparents came to work in the fields, and and there's not that many Black people here. And so I think that whenever I I always felt like kind of lonely in that sense that I didn't have like other Black people to share space with, and um, so when I meet other Black people, I feel at home. Like it doesn't matter where physically I am, like I feel at home whenever I find other people from the diaspora. And, and so I think I tried to show that too, like in the documentary, because a lot of them, especially the people who were born and raised in Mexico City had those similar feelings of feeling like isolated and just <clears throat> not being able to find that community. But I think, I think like through time, we've all tried to find it in some way. And that was something that I tried to illustrate in the film. Thank you for answering that question. There's another question by uh, Graciela Colorado. That's one of my students as well. And she's asking, this would be really good for you because you, you studied journalism as well, right? So she's asking how, what would be your advice to a journalism, uh, a young journalist, right? And how they can shape stories really about uh, uh, and narratives of, of, of people of color, right? In general, how can you honor their stories instead of just stealing stealing something from them and they just walk away. Yeah, I think for me, and it probably goes against like what they teach us in journalism class, but because they teach us to be objective and all of that stuff. But for me, definitely, I think 
owning your voice and owning like your perspective, I think is key. And I was, I was actually talking about this yesterday at another panel, like the difference between journalism and documentary film. And I was saying like the only real difference that I could see was that in documentary, um, at least in school, I felt just more free to own my voice. Whereas in journalism, it was very much like, you must be objective. Um, and I think also like looking at your art, or your art or your piece your written piece or your film or whatever you produce as like a collaboration with the community and not just something for you um and also like keeping ties with the community after after you after you write your your piece or after you make your piece I think it's really important for me it's yeah I think that's the biggest thing is seeing it as a collaboration and a mutual thing instead of just something that you can take uh, we have another question. This is uh, from uh, Professor David Mogel. Um, it's a very long question, so I don't know if you can read it. Uh, it's, it speaks about the um, racism that exists in Mexico towards Black people, right? And, and obviously all across Latin America. Uh, and he's, is, um, he's trying to ask a question about what is the difference between uh, that kind of racism in, in Latin America and in Mexico than the one that exists probably in the US, right? How? Um, yeah, I see it. But I do not believe that black people in Mexico and Latin America are feared. What do you think? Um, I think for one, I think that also blackness in, in Latin America is also different, like depending on which country you're in, like blackness in Mexico is way different than blackness in Brazil, way different than blackness in Colombia. And I think that like, I see a lot of similarities actually of how black people in um, Brazil and in the US are treated in that sense. Um, just from like talking to black Brazilians, I feel like there's a lot of similarities, but, but, um, but in Mexico, I mean, it's, it's, I can only speak from my own experience. And, and I think also my experience is slightly different because I'm seen as a woman and so, and so um, I feel like in that sense, it's like I've felt there's definitely the, the racism that I feel more is that I felt generally is like the innocent racism of like touching my hair and all of that stuff. But, um, but I've also like been, there's also been like aggressive experiences, especially with authorities, especially with like migration and all of that stuff. And, and I know if that's happening to me, someone with a US passport, I know it's even more aggressive for someone who's from Mexico or for, for someone who's not who's not from Mexico, who's from another country like Colombia, or like Haiti and things or Af or in a country in Africa and things like that. Um, and I and I and I even feel within Mexico, like I feel that the racism is more aggressive in Tijuana. At least I feel that I feel that like within my being than it is in Mexico City. Um, but you know, I can only speak from my own experience. <laughs> is, is that so because of the presence of people from Haiti in, in at the border region that you felt in Tijuana? Because you yeah. did also a documentary on it, right? On, yeah, I also did a, a documentary on in Tijuana. And I, I think, yeah, the, I think one is like the presence of Haitians and Africans. And I think two, like the increase of militarization in Mexico and like persecuting migrants who are trying to cross to the US. And I think it's easy for authorities in Mexico to just racially profile black people as foreign. Um, and even though it's also, they also profile Central Americans and people from other countries too. But I think that that like heightened, like militarization has also just heightened xenophobia in general. And yeah. uh, xenophobia is targeted at black people. Correct. Um, Jasmine Cardenas asked a similar question, right, about uh, your experience in the U.S. being a black, a black skin woman compared to the in Mexico, which you already addressed that, I think so. So I'm going to skip that one and then move to the next one uh, that somebody's saying that they want to thank you. Uh, Aide Sandoval, she said, uh, thank you for opening my eyes. I was born in Mexico City. I want to ask what was the main challenge in making this film? Um, the main challenge in making the film, uh, the filming part was actually pretty smooth. I feel like for the most part, uh, everybody was super collaborative. I got really sick when I was filming Lena's part. 
Um, and so like, if you were to ever watch the raw footage and you can hear me like saying one, two, three, grabando, you can hear my voice. Um, <laughs> and so that, that, that day was actually really hard because I was sick and we were down like one staff, staff person, like one uh, crew member. Um, so yeah, I think the hardest part for me was finding, was uh, editing, not necessarily the editing part, but just like the time that it would take to edit and the lack of like funding that I had during the editing part. And so it was a lot of like working, but also editing at the same time. And it was just like no sleep and all that stuff. It, it didn't feel, for the most part though, the film didn't feel that challenging in general. It felt like really joyful to make in general. Um, yeah, I think it's, it had a lot to do with the fact that I had already known the people who I, who I was interviewing. Um, and a lot of the collaborators, the sound people and the people behind the scene were also people who I was already, who I was already friends with. Uh, we're running out of time and we have a lot of questions, which is really great, but I don't think we will be able to address all these questions for, for Ebony. Uh, I will try to save the, the chat. I will save the chat. So, so I, will, I will ask her to see if there are some questions that she can answer probably. Uh, or we can do it later on while we present all the other folks that are part of the panel. I'm running a little bit late. I was looking at the schedule that Steve Gute pre prepared for us. And now I'm late and present and introducing Jason and Yoali to the, to, the, to the panel. So I'm going to switch to that, uh, to that part of it. Uh, so uh, we, can, we, can, we can introduce the two young people. Uh, when we started doing this, uh, wanted to invite uh, Ebony to present her uh, film. We realized, and I wanted to have somebody who had a, a more robust uh, knowledge about what's going on in Mexico, right? With Afro-Mexican populations. Uh, and I discovered two wonderful uh, young scholars, uh, Jason uh, Porter, um, he's a PhD candidate in history. He's extremely popular on Twitter. So if you wanna follow him, it's a wonderful thing to follow him just because you learn a lot. He educates us a little bit through social media, which is a, a, a wonderful thing to do by all timers like myself. I've never imagined that you can use those social media sites to educate people about so many topics. And he's very engaging. Uh, uh, he's a PhD uh, uh, a student at Northwestern University. And obviously he's studying uh, in the intersection of agrochemicals, ecology, food, energy, and power, and environmental justice in Mexico and in, Latin, in the United States as well. Um, he's a former Fulbright uh, Garcia Robles uh, scholar. Uh, unfortunately, he was a Fulbright scholar while the pandemic was. So I guess he it, this, it really messed up with his research as he was trying to be in Mexico safe. And then he had to uh, run away from Mexico and the, and the Fulbright people didn't want to pay their money that they owed to, to him and to others. So it was quite a kind of a quest that I follow uh, slowly through social media as well. Uh, he's doing research in Mexico. Obviously he's uh, finishing his dissertation and he's also uh, part of the Noria Mexico and Central America group. And he's uh, in the editorial committee uh, as a member for the NACLA, which is a really uh, a very important publication on Latin American affairs, right? And then Yoali, um, Yoali Rodriguez, she's uh, a PhD candidate uh, in uh, Latin American studies at the University of Texas in Austin. She's an anthropologist, right? And she's actually uh, doing field work in the, in the area, she's looking at the uh, at gender, environment, racism, mestizaje, and state politics, right? And, uh, and violence in Mexico. Uh, she's uh, from the, uh, obviously, UT, I have a soft spot for UT Austin as well as I am a, a graduate of that school as well. Yoali uh, uh, also is doing wonderful work and I think she's about also to finish her, defend her dissertation. Welcome you both. To, to this event. Uh, so I think uh, Jason is gonna start doing the presentation, right? Jason, you go first. 
I'll go first. I'll go first. It's a it's a pleasure to be followed up by Yoeli. It's also a pleasure to be here. Thanks again for the invitation, Jose Luis. Um, it's also just a pleasure to be back at Cal State uh, Northridge for the second time in a few months. Um, I had a pleasure talking to a group of students um, last month or in November, which was delightful. So super happy to be back. You guys are amazing. Real quick, I want to give a shout out to good friends in the Oxnard area who actually published recently the Guerrero Diaspora Zine. Um, there, it, so it's, it's also produced by a lot of people from the Ghetto Diaspora that live throughout California. Um, my man, Yoel, who also writes, who's the author in this, is currently at UC Davis. There are dozens of authors in this book that are across Southern and Northern California. I also want to give a shout out to Northwestern, which is odd. I usually wouldn't do that. Um, but the reason why we'll do that is because the first academic study of Blackness in Mexico La Costa Chica in particular started at Northwestern, and that's why I am there to follow the, the, the research of um, uh, Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran, who did his dissertation work on La Costa Chica at um, Northwestern. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a little background, a little bit of the history uh, following up. Uh, just to give a little roadmap, I'll start a little in the colonial period, and I'll talk a little bit about Arieros and the importance of Afro-descendant um, muleteers. Um, like Vicente Guerrero and Juan Alvarez, who both became presidents of Mexico and were incredible independence leaders. I'll talk a little bit about Arieros. I'll talk a little bit about the ge geographic uh, othering of Blackness in Mexico as something that takes place in Guerrero. Um, as some, and uh, you know, I'm from Philadelphia, so a lot of people associate Philadelphia with a place where bad things happen. I think there's a similar association like Guerrero, with Guerrero, like, you know, La Cosa Chica, Acapulco, Tierra Caliente, La Montaña, it doesn't really matter. The whole state is really dangerous. Um, and it's also a state full of beauty, so much beauty. When I started studying Guerrero, first time I went there was 2013. My mother was like, you can't study it. And I was like, bet, let me bring my grandparents down there. I took my grandfather fishing in Zihuatanejo. And after that, she never gave me a problem. So um, maybe in questions, I'll, I'd love to talk a little bit more about um, the environment in particular, very dry, shrub-like, um, environment actually reminds me of, you know, where I went to um, elementary school and middle school in Tucson, Arizona, um, in terms of it being a very, um, uh, not, not like big, it's not a jungle, it's not Chiapas, it's not La, La Condon, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit higher than like the Yucatan, but okay, quick on the background. So environmental racism was really important in the, the, the explanation of why people of African descent were brought to um, Nueva España in the very beginning, right? Um, essentially, the notion that you know the people of the Western Africa is being disease resistant um, and wouldn't die in the same droves as the, the you know the terrible amounts of you know people who indigenous uh, communities that died because of smallpox and other diseases brought by Europeans, right? Europeans weren't happy with that incredible amount of death. They didn't necessarily try to prevent it either, but they lost their labor pool. They lost a massive amount of labor pool, especially in coastal regions like Veracruz, um, Sinaloa, which also had a very big Afro-descendant population in the colonial period, but also Guerrero and, and, and Oaxaca. Also Campeche had a slave, had a slave port. Um, and then also there were a lot of um, Afro-descendants in, in, in what now is Quintana Roo because of Belize. They're throughout the country as you see from the map. But because of these concentrations and the idea that black folks or people of African descent could be in these hot climates in the coast. They could withstand these diseases. They could be, like Ebony said, in these remote areas, very far from the cities, very far from anything. You know, one time I was in Costa Chica, I actually woke up, there was a rattlesnake in my room. And had the, the abuela in my, you know, that killed it for me, and I got bitten, where would I have gone? I was 300 miles away from a hospital. Right, so that just gives you an example of how dangerous it is. Just any everyday life in Costa Chica, you know, it's a place filled with cascabels or you know, um, or rattlesnakes, right? But you know, uh, you know, a mere bite would be so much more would be so much more devastating if you're in a Metapec than if you're in Santa Cruz or if you're in you know, in Acapulco, even closer to the hotels, right? So that idea of being remote, being hot, 
being, you know, places where diseases until to this day, you know, you have Costa Chica, it's filled with dengue, it's filled with issues of malaria, it's filled with issues of water contamination, which Yoel is going to get into later, and COVID, right? Um, so issues of environmental races continue to compound the life um, and a livelihood of, of, of people of African descent, people of Afro-Indigenous descent, and mestizos in the Costa Chica, right? Um, the diversity abounds. So there were a lot of different occupations, um, you know, as, as Ebony said, you know, one thing that's really important during the kind of the, in the, the early independence movement, when, you know, when Jose Maria Morelos was, you know, who was an arriero, who arguably of Afro descent from Michoacan, Michoacan had a lot of black arrieros in the Tierra Caliente. Um, when he came down to the Costa Chica in 1810 and 1811, it was mulatto sharecroppers, Peter Guardino writes about this. There were mulatto sharecroppers who were like, yeah, we don't like the Spanish, let's go, right? But then there were also militia men who are of African descent in parts of the Costa Chica as well, who were like, we kind of want to vibe with the Spanish. So just to, you know, I think that's, you know, back to Ebony's point, there isn't one idea of blackness. There wasn't just one association with what did blackness or Afro-descendancy or representation mean to the Mexican independence. But you know, one thing that is very clear that from 1815 to 1820, when the revolution, when the independence movement of Mexico largely stopped, where was it fought? In the coast of Guerrero. By whom? Afro and Afro indigenous people under the leadership of Vicente Guerrero. And oh my goodness, there's, an, there's a famous um, woman who, who had five sons, but she was also. A, a beast on the battlefield, also from Tixla, for like uh, Vicente Guerrero. Her last name was Catatlan, I can't remember her first name. But anyways, there was also, also women, indigenous women leading this movement too. But I just wanna highlight how important those five years were. That it's arguable that there, there, Mexico wouldn't have became what it did when it did in 1821, had it not been for that five years that Arieros and other people of African descent rallied around Vicente Guerrero and fought and fought and fought. I think that's really important to remember that it's just not about presence and that they exist, that they existed at the important times and the foundation of this, of, of Mexico. I'm talking like I'm still living in Mexico City. Um, I, I wish I had a piece to show you about this right now, but I'll send you, I have a piece coming out precisely about Arieros and independence. Um, um, and, and, and environmental racism next week. And I'll send it to Jose Luis to send out to everybody else if you wanna look further into that history. But I wanna get into, into, into the 20th century, right? So I talked about, you know, it's already really, uh, you know, the othering of, of Guerrero is really, is really some kind of tragic. And if you look at a lot of the military officials in Mexico during the Pipiriato, they're actually really, really, really interested in the life and betrayal of Vicente Guerrero. How did, how did this man, you know, lead, you know, the independence movement for five years almost by himself, become the first Afro-Indigenous president of Mexico in 1829, abolish slavery in 1829, or elected 1828, abolish slavery in 1829, but then he's rushed out of Mexico City, chased into Guerrero, he's tricked, captured, and executed. And for the rest of the 19th century, Mexican politicians have to live with how they betrayed Vicente Guerrero, right? Especially the Liberal Party, right? Um, and I think that there's, you know, when Juan Alvarez, who was, was the right man hand of Vicente Guerrero, leads the plan of Ayutla to fight against um, um, uh, uh, Santa Ana, um, Antonio Santa Ana de, de uh, Lopez de Santa Ana. Um, to, to basically usher in Benito Juarez's period, um, he gives up the presidency right away because he doesn't want to get betrayed like Vicente and he goes back to Guerrero. And until the rise of Acapulco in the 1940s, Guerrero is without major roads that lead from Mexico City to Acapulco. It's the only state in the country that doesn't have a railroad, a Porfirian railroad to connect. And we're talking about Acapulco, which was the bread and butter of the colonial period, falls off for the 19th century. There's no investment. It is abandoned. It is the least in, it is the least connected. But then things shift with Acapulco. Not only is Acapulco this, this gem that brings in everybody around the world wants to see, but it's also 
the major producer, the Costa Chica, Costa Grande and Costa Chica, the major producer of oil seeds, cotton, coconut, um, sesame seeds. And you're like, why do these matter? The reason why they matter is because they become these fungible or interchangeable parts that produce our soaps, our processed foods, our detergents, our, um, you know, for instance, a lot of the gas masks that were used in World War I and World War II came from coconuts from Costa Chica and Costa Grande, right? A lot of the glycerin used in bombs, a lot of the materials that are used to feed people in Mexico City, you know, to make the margarines, to make the manteca, right? Come from different oil producing crops that come from Costa Chica. But you know, what's really violent about that is that oil seeds are just that, they're fungible. When you read that label and it says this package of chips may contain cotton seed or coconut oil or sesame seed oil, literally the company is saying right then and there, we may need this community one, com then one year, we might need this community the next, I don't know, we probably don't need this community you know, if this price is low. So essentially they became interchangeable producers of commodities wherein that they were, when you were adding value into the agricultural commodity chain, that value added never got to Costa Chica. That value added never got to Costa Grande, right? So while they became, and Guerrero became the, the world's largest producers of coconut. Every, and coconut products are in thousands of, you know, coconut is in thousands of products, but the process and added value is always in manufacturing. It's always in changing it into an oil that's made somewhere else, right? So that money never goes back to that. And that to some extent also explains like kind of the divestment that is the, you know, that feeds in with Acapulco, right? And I just wanna end with that to kind of show on so many different levels, this coast, this space, these people have been fundamental in the formation of Mexican nation, but then also the political economy of you know a lot of these a lot of the foods feeding Mexico City did not require just Mexico City right feeding Mexico City required a lot of the Pacific Sinaloa Nayarit and Guerrero in particular and a lot of the campesinos in the agrarian reform that built those and I could get into this history a little bit more how how corporate agrarian reform was even as far back as the 1930s that tied the the the, the agriculture of the coast to the feedings of cities that essentially agrarian reform was for urbanization and it never was to actually figure out ways to pay farmers in rural spaces for this. So this isn't just a this isn't just a Costa Chica problem, right? But I think it's compounded by you know the fact that they've been neglected both politically, geographically, in terms of public health. And I think there's a great place that'll leave Yoeli off because she she also works on the oil seeds weren't the only things that are being produced in the coast. They're not the only things that have left this space, you know, with disproportionate, disproportionate amounts of deforestation and erosion and contamination. And uh, she, she'll hit that out of the park. So thank you guys again for your time. It has been a true pleasure. I, I hope I didn't go over my time. I was trying to play a little bit of catch up. I also hope I didn't speak too fast in my attempts to play catch up. Um, so I look forward to your questions. It's been Again, an, an honor. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. It's wonderful. Thanks for thanks for your presentation. And I'm and I'm really sorry it had to be that short. We would <laughs> love to hear more from you. I'm getting all these comments in the chat about how amazing is what you're presenting. Uh, Yoali, would you mind would you mind uh, presenting yours? We were thinking of, of doing first Jason and then Yoali, so we will have a discussion after that. And I promise I will stay away. From people who know better, which these two and, and Ebony really know what they're talking about as they've been researching it for a while. Well, thank you all. Uh, first, to the California State University Northridge for having us. It's also an honor for me to be sharing the panel with Ebony and Jason, two friends that we've been sharing. Me and Jason wrote a couple of pieces together. And Ebony and I, we constantly are talking every day on Instagram. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'm really excited to be here. And also, I'm, I'm glad that Jason came before me because he gave, again, like the historical context for about what I'm going to say right now. 
Can you all see the, the screen? Okay, so my presentation for today is titled Environmental Racism in Amistizo Geography. First of all, um, what is environmental racism? It's a concept that uh, search in, in, in between the 70s and the 80s in the context of US in the environmental justice movement. And uh, basically it means how people of color are disproportionately affected by environmental injustices. In this case, in the context of Mexico, how black and indigenous people are disproportionately affected by environmental policies and practices in Mexico. So first of all, just so we can have like a visual location or of where I was working. On this map, uh, we can see this is Oaxaca, so it's in the southeast of Mexico. And then on this other map, as you all can see here is Oaxaca. And then in the coast, you can see that there are so many bodies of water that are connected. And this is where I was working. This is where I did my field work. It's in the, it is a system of lagoons. So it's many lagoons that are connected. And I was here in Chacawa lagoons. So first I wanted to share uh, how it started everything and how I came there. I, I arrived there in September of 2017 to the Chacawa lagoons in the Costa Chica area that Ebony and Jason have described before but it, it's in the state of Oaxaca. So basically, Christina is a fisherwoman, a black fisherwoman. She was in the middle of the lagoons and she felt an unusual movement of water. And so she was, she was surprised and scared. And how she describes this scene is, the water started to look like it was boiling, a lot of bubbles, as if something was being born from below. The water got very hot, it started to smell like sulfur. What Christina discovered late, later after this scene is that uh, the initial movement in the water, it was because of an earthquake, a 7.1 scale Richter earthquake that I don't know many, may, if many of you have or heard about this big earthquake that had a lot of damages on communities in Oaxaca, but even in Mexico City, in Puebla, in Morelos, there were so many communities affected by it. But the curious and also at the same time not so curious part of it is that these uh, other consequence to the environment in the Chacawa Lagoons, it didn't appear in any newspaper, no one knew about these consequences. And this is part of how it is environmental racism in the sense that some uh, consequences are racialized and they, they don't matter for the, for the news or for the government and that's why they're also inv inv invisibilized. Uh, people were wondering what happened, why this terrible scene that you can see in the pictures, this is what happened one day after the earthquake, thousands of fish were uh, found floating dead. And I asked the people like what happened, why the earthquake, like what is the consequence of this and they, they from their deep knowledge of the environment and what was happening, they say basically that there were toxic gas gases on the subsoil of the lagoons and with the movement of the water, these gases came into the surface killing the fish. And unfortunately, this was not the first one or the last time that happened. Like this is a scene that you can constantly see. I was in the coast, uh, in the Costa Chica area for one year. So I was 12, 12 months living there. And this was a scene that you would see any other day. Like when you would approach to the lagoons, you would see fish of all sizes, small, large fish dead on the, on, the, on the bay of the lagoons. My research questions are how does environmental racism function in the context of mestizaje? As many of you all know, mestizaje is the ideology on how the Mexican state was founded. And it basically says that the myth, this is a national myth, and the myth says that basically all Mexicans quote unquote, are mestizos. And this means it's a mix of Spanish descendant with indigenous descendant. But as we say, as, as we know in this narrative, basically black population gets out of this narrative. It's eliminated from the narrative of the nation. And uh, so I wanted to, to explore how environmental racism function in the context of a country that basically denies racism because the argument is, since we're all mixed, 
then there's no possibility of the existence of, of racism. However, I believe that is through geography and through environmental racism that we can see one of the many concrete ways that racism works in Mexico. And the second question was, what are the practices of survival used by black and indigenous women facing human and non-human death? This is because aside from uh, the ecocide that is happening, as, you, as Jason also shared, uh, the Costa Chica area is also, uh, it is affected by narcotraffic, specifically also in the communities that I was working with. It is a narco route. So there was also people dying uh, for nar by narcotraffic and state violence too. So what happened uh, with the ecocide? What are the causes? There are many causes, there are many factors that come into play for this slow death of the lagoons. One of the factors, as you can see on, on some of the pictures, like this one and this one, uh, in, in the early 2000s, the government tried to make an ecotouristic project to create a bay in between the Pacific Ocean and the lagoons. So they built these breakwaters that are basically like all these huge blocks of concrete and rocks because they wanted to change the course of the water so they could create a bay. However, they did change the course of the water, but what they did was disconnected the ocean from the lagoons, creating the isolation of the lagoons and the, and the stagnation of the water. So the lagoons usually were having oxygen from the ocean, but now with these, after this project, it disconnected and left the lagoons without the oxygen from the Pacific Ocean. What is also important to say here is that uh, local people that again have a deep knowledge of, the, of their environment, they constantly said to the people from the government, the engineers that were there working like, this is not gonna work. What is gonna happen is you're gonna disconnect the lagoon from the ocean. And what did the government and the engineering said? Like, you don't know anything. We're the ones who are the experts. We have our university titles. So here, again, we have another epistemological violence on how uh, local knowledges are invisibilized, ignored, and this is what happened, an ecological catastrophe that until today, 2021, is still, 20 years later, is still the lagoons in the state that it is. Another factor is, uh, and connecting it, what Jason was talking about, the oil production, is uh, there's a oil lime factory uh, very close to the to the lagoons and all the waste from this factory of lime oil through canals go into the lagoons and because this lime oil is highly acidic and toxic so this is another big factor and a third factor is that uh, the Costa Chica area is the uh, the most big product producer of papaya crops but also of many other crops that are growing and obviously with this there's a lot of use of pesticides and through air, through the rain and air, all these pesticides also get into the lagoons. And as you can see on this picture, this is the color of the lagoons is green. This is not a, a typical color of the lagoons, usually it's, it's blue. And many people from the community say like, it's the same, it's like if you don't change the water in a glass of water, like what is the color? Is going to become green. So it's basically the same thing. And with climate change, very high temperatures during the summer, this is what is happening. So now the lagoon is basically slowly dying and is on risk of dying. So there's actually an ecocide. So now um, I wanted to share also, as I was talking before about uh, mestizaje ideology and a term and a concept that I'm proposing for my dissertation and I hope my future book that is called Mestizo Geography. And I define Mestizo Geography as the material side, as a material tool of the Mestizaje ideology to dispossess and eliminate uh, Black Indigenous territories and their inhabitants through the basically Mexican state saying, all that is in the Mexican uh, territory is federal, uh, ownership, 
all this territory is also mestizo identity. So they impose an identity, but they also impose ownership over the lands, ancestral lands of indigenous people, of black populations. And basically mestizo geography could, could be understood as a tool of the mestizaje nationalism. Here is one book that may, maybe some of you all know that is very, very famous by this philosopher and, and we can say the architect of, one of the architects of the mestizaje ideology that is Jose Vasconcelos. In this book, basically he argues that uh, the mix with the mix of five races, there's gonna have, there's gonna become a superior race called the cosmic race. However, when you read into this book, he's arguing basically that uh, this mixture, this cosmic race is gonna have more white traits and black and indigenous traits are gonna disappear. So in the end, yes, it's a mix, but the, the project is that it's gonna be a whitening project as many other anthropologists and sociologists have argued. And so with my dissertation, I wanna explain how through this mestizaje ideology that is deeply anti-black and anti-indigenous, uh, we can see it not only in abstract ways as ideology, but we can see it in concrete ways through the ecocide and elimination of black and indigenous geographies. And as Ebony also was saying, for me it was important not only to go there and impose my project. So I did my, my ethnography on, on based on the principles of activist research. And this is how uh, I was interested in working with the subject of racism in Mexico. So when I arrived to the community, I also asked like, what do you want me from? What, how can I help? How, how can my dissertation, like if anything can be used for something, no? And people from the community were like, okay, we need that you denounce what is happening with the lagoons and then you make a documentation of what is happening. So in this sense, this has been a dialogue and a collaboration with the people and women in the community until today. And it's also based on principles of feminist ethnography. And what does this mean is basically that through my work, I'm also denouncing the structures of power that are happening in the region. I did 14 months of field work in the region that I live there, 60, 66 in-depth interviews, oral history, participant observation, uh, but I also did community mapping with women so to understand how they're relating to their territory. And I also did multi situated ethnography in the coast of Oaxaca, Oaxaca City and Mexico City. And what have people been doing against this ecocide? Of course, people have been mobilizing in multiple ways. For example, here we can see some men from the community that have been doing protests in front of the government office in Oaxaca in Mexico City. Some of here, here it says, please, we need oxygen. Like they're actually saying like, when are we gonna have again the breakwater open? Uh, there have been also with the collaboration of national human rights organizations, uh, reports of how this ecocide are, is violating multiple human rights. For example, the access to a healthy environment, even the access to, to uh, a vida digna, like a good life and access to health. So, and in 2018, the case was actually taken to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights as a case of environmental racism. But until today, again, the Mexican state has not done anything about it. Also, uh, women in the, but this is, usually this is how we think of activism, right? Like protest, human rights reports. But in my dissertation, I also wanted to explore a broader definition of activism. How can we think of politics in the everyday life, specifically performed by women? So in this sense, I engage also with the feminist and uh, economist Marxist Silvia Federici and her work of everyday work of reproduction of lives through domestic labor. This is how domestic work and domestic labor actually is reproducing life um, in the everyday life by basically solving the, the practical needs that we need to survive every day. In the case of the community, women, for example, are doing tortillas, fishing, cooking, cleaning the house. Because they're facing this ecocide 
and the primary source of living that is the lagoons, either for, for consumption of the fish or for uh, fishing and then selling the fish. Basically, they are they have food scarcity and, and well, basically they have to start like thinking of other ways to keep living. So I, I found that they were also doing mutual aid initiatives. For example, in between women, they take care of each other's children when some of the women have to go out of the community to work or if they're fishing. They also exchange food when there's lack of food and they cook together. So there's actually like community, uh, constant community work. They have also done like alternative economies to face the ecocide. For example, here we can see some medicinal plant products that women are creating. And this is also, this also talks about the intimate relationship in between women and their environment because they have deep knowledge of the plants, what are the medicinal, uh, the medicinal like uh, characteristics of the plants and the environment. And with this, they're selling it to tourists, but also like to other communities, they travel to other communities and create that. And they are also doing uh, traditional clothing from the coast. And also here we can see a picture of uh, some of the fisherwomen from the community. And I can see, and we can see how there are practices of human and non-human care in between the lagoons and the women. Uh, for example, women each month until today, because I talked to them like uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were telling me they're still doing, they're cleaning the lagoon. So basically in this photo, they are, they are in a canal that is connected to another lagoon as, because as you saw on the first map, it's a, it's a system of lagoons. So in this photo, they're in one of these canals and they're cleaning the canal. So they say, so the lagoon can have one access of oxygen, a point of oxygen. And they're also starting and reproducing mussels because they were also affected by it. So they say like, we have to start like uh, reproducing mussels. And another project that they have is to start reforesting the lagoons with the mangroves because the mangroves are also dying. So they're trying like to reforestate it. And well, that would be all. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Yoali. Uh, you guys are amazing. I think both of you are doing really wonderful uh, work and a very important work in, in the community. Um, uh, uh, a couple of household things. People are asking uh, uh, a lot of questions about what's about your presentation. So there's interest in, 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 in having these presentations and all the panel uh, taped. So we will tape it and we will make it available to, we're taping it, we're, we'll make it available at the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center. I put the, uh, the URL address there. We also have a YouTube channel. Uh, we are a young uh, center, so we are still learning how to do all this stuff that other people can do better because they have a lot of resources. We're a small team, so we're, we're learning our ropes. Uh, I, I wanna open the, the, the chat for questions for people who have questions about your presentations. And obviously I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by what you guys are doing. Your research, Joali, is just amazing. I think it resonates with me, I'm Mexican, right? So I can understand this ideology of mestizaje being an ideology of oppression, right? For, and, and, and violence against indigenous and black people. And, and Jason's uh, uh, presentation also makes me aware as I'm teaching also a journalism history here at Nordridge, how much uh, uh, black history, as we're in the Black History Month, black history is central, not only to the US, to understanding the US history, but also how black uh, history is central to understand Mexican history, right? And I think that's the, that to me, that's all, those are the two more powerful, uh, uh, I mean, in my, in my point of view, of course, there are other people that are, that are listening from other perspectives, but I think from my perspective, those are two big takeaways that that we can have from uh, your presentations, and I think they blend really well with uh, uh, what uh, Ebony Ebony's documentary is about. So let me see what questions are out there, so you guys can uh, start addressing them. And 
feel free also to start a conversation among yourselves. I know that you guys know each other, your friends, uh, which is great. Uh, that's, uh, that's a wonderful way of, of doing what you're doing, right? You create a community of scholars, a community of media creators, right, as well. Uh, so let's see, a question for you, Ali, from Melody Soto. It's, it says, uh, last year's massive uh, protest led by, by Black Lives Matters groups made an impact on the world in your study, resistance and alliances between Black and, uh, I guess, Indigenous women in Oaxaca. Uh, have you found in, uh, influences, parallels between the US-based Black Lives Matters efforts and the missions led uh, by the, uh, these Oaxacan alliances? Do you see some parallel, basically? Um, I mean, in the community organizing, yes, and many of the that maybe everyone knows, uh, for example, Rosa Maria Castro and Yolanda, they're like, uh, Yolanda is Afro Mixteca, so there's also, no, there's also Afro Indigenous population, uh, but they have done, uh, they have, Rosa Maria talks uh, a lot about the Black Lives Movement in the US and how the, it has influenced like a lot of the mobilization in the coast in the sense of how can we organize collectively against like injustices. So in that sense, they're very aware of what is happening, some of them, and they see it more like how can we keep organizing and we can connect like hemispherically to keep doing this. And in that sense, that's why they were also like, we have to make sure that what is happening in our with our lagoons is known. It, it breaks this like uh, information barrier that is happening because of also racism and that people don't care about what is happening there. So they are like, we have to start like also reaching internationally like to other places. And I feel that Black Lives Matter have done like really great job with in the sense that it has become like a global, like powerful uh, narrative. And in this sense, I feel that women from the community feel that they have to do that as well. So I think those could be the parallels. That's wonderful. Somebody was somebody asked before when you're doing your presentation as well, if, if it is reversible, the, the damage that is being caused to the, uh, to the lagoons. I mean, it, it is reversible if, the government would, first of all, uh, say sorry for what we did. <laughs> this is one of the demands from the local people, like the Mexican state has to apologize because the local people said, this is gonna happen, this is what is gonna happen and they ignore it. So as I said, it's an epistemological act of violence, but at the same time, uh, the government also has to basically take out all those big concrete uh, blocks that I share on my on the photos, because as you saw, you need industrial machine. How you say machinaria? You you need machinery. Yeah, you need like industrial actually capacity to move those. Obviously, people from the community have tried um, manually to reconnect the lagoons from the ocean with shovels, and because now uh, in between the lagoons and the ocean, they're like us. Uh, sand dunes so you could feel that you were in the middle of the desert like you actually walk on those sand dunes and it's like a sand from the ocean and people have tried like manually to to try to destroy that those dunes but it's too much like it's impossible to move it plus the, the concrete blocks keep like changing the the course of the water so it is reversible, but the government would need to change and move those rocks that they put there in the first place. And now the last part, the last thing that I know, because I'm constantly like in conversation with people from the community is that uh, they were like, okay, so the government now is saying that it will require millions of pesos to move those concrete uh, blocks. And that now there, there's a new government with AMLO uh, that they have to do again another budget. So anyways, nothing is happening, but yes, it is re reversible. Um, first with that, and also it would have to make like some change. And I think that some management or something with that lime oil factory that is uh, 
basically throwing all the waste into the lagoons. I think it will have to basically the government also like try to stop them from doing that. Thanks, Joali. Jason had some comment about it. He had some follow up. Make sure I'm not muted. Um, yeah, I would also because I love the I love the Black Lives Matter conversation. I think I think it's also to tie to the defund the police conversation because if you spend if you spend a day on Highway 200, which goes between Acapulco all the way through Costa Chica, all the way to Puerto Escondido, you will see Policia Estatal, La Marina. Uh, you'll see your know, auto defense groups. You'll see Policia uh, Civica. You'll see, I mean, you'll literally see on one road, seven different policing entities on one road. So it's not, it's not just about reinvesting you know, you know, money that went into these bad projects, right? Into the communities themselves, along the lines of what you're already saying, following their own epistemology, what they think should be done, right? As opposed to what the state or what foreigners think should be done. But it's also about radically reconsidering who, what is protecting these spaces, because it certainly isn't these p policing groups, because they're certainly not protecting these people from the, the narco trafficking that's happened in these spaces, or just the general violence that's happening in these spaces. So I think it's generally trying to, where does that money go back into? So taking out, taking out infrastructure, taking out, but it's also, you know, I don't think we should go and say that these places don't need to have new new things like new because there is an exodus issue right like the, you know just like you know i went to college in mississippi the lack of you know jobs and the lack of malls and the lack of movie theaters make people want to go to chilpancingo make people want to go to acapulco make people want to go to you know to mexico city too so i don't think we should just sit here and say that like you know new roads bring violence they do you know, they, they, they do, they were built to follow Lucio Cabanas and Enero Vasquez, right? Like they were, you know, like in the seventies, right? But at the same time, we can't just say that, you know, I think I, I cannot say from my position as a researcher who's unlike Yoeli in communication with these communities constantly, I'm not in a position to say that, but should I follow up one of this next question? Sure. Uh, so to, the one thing I'll just say is, I think that, I think a lot of it's not really particular to the, to Mexico. I mean, if you think about, the use and the abandonment of black military power across Latin America during independence movements. This is this is part and parcel what happens, you know, when you know when 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 all these different colonies rallied for representation so they wouldn't have to be beholden to Spanish to Spanish anymore, you know, between like after the Council of Cadiz, this is long history back in 1814. Essentially, you had in Colombia, you had in uh in, in Mexico. You had in Cuba a little bit later, but you basically had you know mestizos and landowners saying that we wanted representation of the black population so that we could actually you know push away from the Spanish, right? So it's very different from a three fifths rule in the United States. Three fifths rule was that the, the South did not want full representation, or, or there was issues along that line. Right? But in in the case of Mexico and Colombia, it was very different. They wanted to recognize these populations, so they, they had a bigger vote away from Spanish to actually push independence. However, immediately after independence, what happens in Colombia? The complete abandonment and violent backlash against the black you know, leadership in Cartagena. What happens in, in, in to Vicente Guerrero and Juan Alvarez, the complete abandonment of the, of the contingent of black indigenous fighters who had, had not just had the arms, but also were like the voting block, right? Same thing that happens in 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 in, in Cuba. You know what happens in 1912? You know the the first black political party, the PIC. You know they fought for decades for Cuban liberation. And what happens? The whole idea of the you know Jose Marti and the idea of what it means to enter this body politic in the Americas had to push out the black military voice, right? It happened time and time again. So I think it's, it's, it's about nation formation in this, in our, you know, a white supremacist capitalistic society that like literally has gates on like who can enter as a body politic. And if your body politic as a nation has too much black, mm, you might want to do something with that because we don't actually want you to actually 
you know, um, partake in the international economy in the same way. These were the conversations, you know, at the time of World's Fair in the 19th century, you know, to, to push those, 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 those communities down, right? Um, so I think, I think it's not just a Mexico case because you see the same thing in Colombia, you see the same thing in Brazil, you see the same thing in Cuba, that the black political military blocks are always abandoned right after representation is, is received um, and nation is, is established. Um, I don't know if that made any sense. It, it makes perfect sense. I have a question. Somebody posed the question, where is Gobar for everybody? And it says, what would black folks in global North countries, especially the US, do to support the diaspora in places like Mexico, how we can build more solidarity and sense of obligation over nationalism? Um, I think that's a question. <laughs> um, this is something I'm always thinking about. I also wanted to follow up a little bit um, with the last question because I personally also do think it's related to the ideology of mestizaje y la raza cósmica. I think that mestizaje, como, as Yawali said, was, is kind of painted as like this, like kumbaya, we're all mixed type of thing. But in reality, it is a policy of whitening. And you also do see this in other countries, like in Brazil, like la política de blanqueamiento. And in New Mexico, you even see this too, where the government started inviting, como in, in the 20th century, started inviting more European migrants and didn't, um, at least this is what Sena was telling me, um, that they didn't have like any sort of official program with like, for example, African migrants until the 1970s when her dad was actually a part of that and they invited um, people from Senegal to come study in Mexico. And so even if it's not like a, this like official mestizaje, it doesn't officially say that it's like a policy of whitening. You see this with like mejorando la raza, like what does mejorando la raza mean? Bettering the race means to be more white. And I think that when, when, a, when a country centers mestizaje in its national identity, it is inherently erasing the blackness and the indigeneity in that. Um, so I do think that all of that is tied in into into each other and that has like led to this kind of institutional erasure of black identity in Mexico. Um, and then for the next, for the other question, um, I think that that's, you know what, actually I just saw, um, I wonder if I can find it quickly, but I actually just saw uh, someone who I kind of know um, who is from the US, a black woman from the US, but she lives in Mexico. And she just started a, a Martin Luther, it's called the Martin Luther King Jr. Task Force. Um, and it's called the Costa Chica Fund. And so it's actually a bridge that is trying to get uh, black Americans or black people from the North to, to give money in order to support people from La Costa Chica. But I know that she's also, I think she lives in La Costa Chica and she heavily collaborates with people from there. Um, and so I know it's something that's not just like charity in that sense is that they're actually listening to the communities and things like that. But I think that, yeah, ways that we could show support. I think that part of it is listening to other black communities and you know because I feel like a lot of especially like a lot of black Americans we 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 go we come or we go to countries if we're able to and it's not to say that like all black Americans even have the access to to get a passport and go to other countries because most people in my family don't even have a passport but um but in the sense of that if we go to another country we want to connect I think just just like listening to what listening to the struggles in the countries and also like kind of what, what we've been talking about, like learning about the parallel, the parallels and not necessarily imposing one thing over the other. Um, I think that I've been in, I've been in like the Afro circles enough to know that there is a lot of kind of misunderstandings from different diaspora contexts. Um, and I've seen this even not just with like US Mexico, I've seen like Afro Colombianos don't really understand the Mexican context, the Mexican context doesn't really understand Afro Colombia and all of this stuff. And so uh, I think just like listening to each other's context and not necessarily imposing one's type of racism, if that makes sense. Um, and, and yeah, amplifying the voices of people. If I'm thinking about how could black folks in the global North um, do to support diaspora places like Mexico, definitely amplifying, translating. I try to translate as much as I can. I'm like thinking about this in a media perspective. And so 
uh, amplifying, making it available to English speaking audiences, people that you might think might not know about this. Also making parallels because I've met, um, I had a conversation once with uh, a, a long lost relative who's born and raised Virginia, very like black American has never left Virginia and was saying how for them, like the black US struggle was like the only struggle that they really cared about. And then I started talking to them about, you know, but there's a lot of parallels of, with this in Mexico and in, in Brazil and in Colombia and stuff. And then they started, now they have like a more diasporic outlook um, on like black struggle. And so I think that at least from the media standpoint, just amplifying voices, collaborating if you if you can you know if there's a space that that is available for someone like invite someone from those communities or invite an activist and things like that um making documentaries but collaborating with them writing articles thing i'm just thinking about it in a media context jason you ali you guys have something to say about this I would go like with the same line that everyone is saying. I feel that uh, amplifying voices, collaborating with, with the people in the communities. Um, the, I feel that, yeah, a, a work of translation is crucial because I feel language in the end, yes, is a big barrier. So I feel that it needs to happen a more like a constant and more powerful like move of translating histories but even text and theory because people in the community are, are they're theorists like they're creating theory they're creating knowledge and i feel that also that has to need to be recognized uh we also have to break in that sense like some uh violence in between academia and community we have to start like uh talking more uh with the people in the community recognizing their knowledge acknowledging who is working, who's doing the work, who's putting the body, right? Who's there, like actually defending the territories and, and the work. And I mean, I feel that collaboration as well. How are we ethically like connecting and, and collaborating with people? And um, I mean, we have so many wonderful scholars also. Uh, I, I think, for example, also of Ashley Agbasoga, that is also a friend of all of us. She's also doing amazing work. Uh, she also works with uh, the concept of black place making with uh, geographies, black geography. So I feel that also there's so many good scholars that are like doing work. And uh, I feel that expanding that work and connecting making networks, but also like engaging with the communities. And as Ebony says, like if you have the, the access to some kind of resource, even like not not necessarily like monetary, but if you have like a, a good platform or media or whatever, like these are kind of ways where you can, uh, again, put in the center uh, black and indigenous voices. Thanks, Yuali. I had a, I had a comment from the, the uh, one of our mo board members of the Dominetta Bradley Center, uh, Charmaine Jefferson, which I think it might be uh, interesting in, in sort of thinking what you guys are thinking about. She's saying, why don't we try to replicate these during the Hispanic Latino his History um, Heritage Month and probably uh, expand a little bit of exactly what Yoali is saying, right? Trying to reach out also to people in the community as they have some knowledge, right? That we just don't, uh, don't know and, and, and expand this conversation about the Costa Chica and the importance of, uh, uh, Afro Latinos in, in in Mexico, right, and how the, how we can uh, learn more about their situation and help connect uh, people from uh, here, the Los Angeles area and the U.S. to uh, the folks at Costa Chica. Jason, you were going to say you. something. Oh, okay, can I just add two sentences to that? First off, thank you sure. all very much. I really love this discussion. Here's a small side anecdote for you. When I ran the California African American Museum, we brought in the exhibition, The African Presence in Mexico, that had been created in Chicago by the National um, Mexico. uh, Mexican Art Museum. Museum. I probably have it wrong right now in my head. Been a while. And they weren't going to tour that show, but I, I pushed them to let us bring the show to the California African American Museum, which had done many shows over the years. 
that picked up on the African presence in Mexico, but theirs, they did a great job on that show. Mm -hmm. It was Black History Month and a class came in and it was a teacher, a black teacher and most of her students, about 50%, maybe 75% of her students at that time were uh, of, of Mexican or Hispanic or Latino descent, variation thereof. And they came into the back room and they said to me, you gotta come out here because this teacher is really mad. She is really upset. And I said, why? She won't go in, she's very mad. And I went out there and to make a long story short, her point was it was Black History Month and why were we doing somebody else's history? And I sat there for a minute trying to compose myself and said, why don't you think this is your history? And she says, well, it's another country and it's another place and you should be doing black history and there's all this stuff that you could be doing. So besides stopping to tell her all the places that Carter G. Woodson traveled and why he thought about black history as a worldly discussion, I reminded her that Mexico had a stamp of Martin Luther King before the United States. And that if she went in that room, she would look and see just how connected to her students she was. And they could see how connected to her they were. And they'd have a lot to talk about. And she wouldn't have to think that our history only began in 1619. So on the shores of Jamestown. So I just wanted to tell you that what you're doing is so important. There's so many more ways that we can connect. And that was years ago and, I, and that happened. And I knew then that the second thing I had to tell everybody was on Cinco de Mayo. Black people should be celebrating Cinco de Mayo because if it hadn't been for Cinco de Mayo, slavery would have really caught hold in the West. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, Jason, you were gonna say something, right? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna, well, thank you for that, that comment. I appreciate that so much. And um, I was just gonna piggyback on um, Ebony and Yoeli's point about, you know, just, you know, teachers always talking about student-led work. And, you know, um, I think researchers and, you know, artists and filmmakers need to do artists you know, our you know, community-led work. As an environmental historian, I start with soil. Um, I start with plants. Um, I could have talked about Jamaica and Tamarindo and <laughs> and um, and I think it's. I think. I think also it's important to um, communities, but then also part of the reason why I started with the the magazine, the Diaspora magazine, is that you know these communities are worldwide. They're still connected, just like we have family that is everywhere. These communities have family that's everywhere. So I think to, uh, I think as a person of the diaspora, thinks of my, myself as a person of diaspora, I need to start thinking of people in general, everybody as people of the diaspora, right? And I think that that's something that I think is just something that we all can um, to start see ourselves as, you know, and it's as, you know, in, in personal and collective social movements of people that the diaspora. But then I also mentioned um, Aguirre Beltran and his work at Northwestern, just because he had been working for, you know, a decade in Mexico before that, you know. And when Carter G. Woodson started putting stuff out in the 40s, he was, Beltran was one of the first people to publish in the Negro, Negro history, right? And there were also people who were writing on Panama, there were people writing on Colombia. And I just think that right now in the United States, there's just this idea that people in Mexico don't write on Afro-Mexico, which is ridiculous. And I think that, you know, one of the cool things when you go and when you work with scholars in Mexico, is you see that people are working on work stuff in Taxcala, people are doing work on, you know, Afro-Mexicans in Sinaloa, Sonora, Chihuahua, wherever, Tabasco, Chi Chiapas. And I think that there's still this US focus on these particular regions um, that are like hyper visible. Um, or more visible. And I just think that there's something, I just, not to, not to bring it to the hyper visible point, more or less to bring it to the really cite Mexican authors and Mexican, you know, researchers who have been doing this work for a long time. You know, I think, you know, it's, it, Jose Vasconcelos is, is a terrible example of commentary on the black experience in Mexico, obviously that's, you know, but there, there have been so many people who have written great things. And I think that oftentimes people in the United States who already have a disproportionate power on the knowledge production and the circulation of knowledge, you know, it just, it just compound that situation by just 
just saying, oh, this, this topic isn't covered. What? It's not covered in North Carolina, okay? It's not covered at the school that you're standing in Berkeley. But best believe if you spend some time and you go through some of the bookstores in Mexico City, you will find that it's been covered and you can add to those conversations, not start them. And I think that that's something that, that everybody in the United States needs to know that they're adding to something, not starting a gosh darn thing. Yeah, I kind of wanted to add to that because I think my experience actually studying my master's in Mexico City has like warped my view on that a little bit because mm -hmm. most of the people that I've read um, for my the my written thesis have actually been Mex, Mex a few of them have been US USians, but most of them have been Mexican. And I think it's like interesting that now I've been so I've started to I'm been starting to hear that, especially on like the social medias of this like hyper visibility of US scholars studying Afro-Mexico and I just think like I think in in Afro-Mexico or in Afro-Mexican scholarships in Mexico I don't even know if they know about them or at least I did it so I think it's also just interesting too that like you know it's like not even that much of a of a thought <laughs> at least in the Mexican side but I do think that that one thing that we can do and like what Jason was just saying is that we can actively look for people in Mexico writing about writing about these issues um, and actively look in, like, you know, I look in, like, in La Biblioteca de la UNAM, or, like, looking in actual, like, Mexican bookstores and Mexican bibliotecas and all that stuff, um, and you just find, like, so much, so much information, or looking through, like, PhD students, not necessarily people who have, I've cited a lot of PhD students in my, in my thesis, but, like, not necessarily people who are already published or tenured or whatever, too, um, we're all students here, kind of, <laughs> so, so yeah, and then going back into like the history part um, of what Charmaine was saying, I think also just thinking about even our history is connected, you know, like as you were saying, like it didn't start in 1619, like our ancestors could have been moved around to, in the Caribbean, they could have been moved around um, in other parts of the diaspora. I was reading a book about how a lot of a lot of enslaved people in North America were trying to escape to Haiti because Haiti had, already, Haiti had already liberated itself. And so there was already this diasporic connection back in the day. And I think that when we look at our history or even just looking at US Mexico, you know, a lot of people who were enslaved in the United States would escape to Mexico and their descendants are still living um, and vice versa. A lot of them would go back into the US. And so there's all of these like different border crossings that have happened throughout history. And it just like, doesn't make sense to me that we can think of Black U.S. history is just something that happened within these borders when these borders haven't even existed for very long in the first place, but our bodies have been on this side of the world for a really long time. And yeah, that's all I have to say on that issue. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, I know we're reaching very close to 11. Uh, so for those people who plan to be just here till 11, you, you can go away. But before you go, uh, we're going to post quickly uh, our last uh, page, just to let you know uh, where you can find Ebony's uh, uh, documentary, right? Uh, we encourage you to buy it. We encourage you to circulate it. We encourage you to screen it among your friends in your schools. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece to introduce this topic, right? To an American audience. I think it's, uh, it's an incredible job that she's doing. And also you can reach uh, Jason and Yoali. They're both very active in social media, particularly in Twitter. I think those two are one of the main reasons I really log into Twitter as an old uh, guy. I don't log into that uh, much. Uh, it's wonderful if you want to follow them. We will stay a little bit longer. Uh, they uh, agreed to stay a little bit longer in case you want to still to uh, uh, be part of the conversation and hear what they what they want to say, uh, but but uh, obviously, if you have to go, then just uh, go away. Thanks a lot for your comments. I will I will, will save them and and we'll be in touch with you. For those of you who ask, we intend again to take this uh, presentation. We will not take uh, Ebony's documentary, so you have to buy it. Go and go on to the website and buy a copy. It's not really that it's not really that expensive. Uh, it's, easy, it's easy to it's, get and then you will be also, able to screen it. Sorry, sorry, can I say one more thing? Sure, of course. Um, it's also on Canopy too, if anybody has access to, to Canopy um, and you can have access to Canopy instead of buying it if you don't have that access. So yes, I can put the link too in the chat. Beautiful, thank you. 
So um, I'm going to continue opening the floor, I think, for questions. Uh, I, ha I have a lot of those myself, so, but, but I want to see, I want to be respectful because many people were asking questions and making comments. I think I, I haven't had Jason and Duali and Ebony uh, uh, such an animated uh, presentation. I don't know, it's because of these uh, new technologies that allow us to have uh, people um, participating more. But I think you guys generated a lot of interest in what you are doing, right? Uh, so what do you think of the idea of, of, of redoing this in a, in a more community-based, with a more community-based program uh, in the fall? By that time, probably Yoali will be uh, a young professor at some university and, and, and Jason as well, right? They, they will be done with their dissertations. Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Uh, not quite. Uh, Jason still be working on his. No. On his, and, and, and speaking of Jason also, I'm, I'm really jazzed up. I didn't know that, that, that uh, Ramiro Beltran uh, studied at Northwestern, right? I know, I know his uh, work in Mexico as pioneering really this field and, uh, and the fact that you are there and that that's history connected, right, to, to him and to uh, this history of Mexico is just amazing, right? It shows how much we are all connected, right? All. Certainly. I mean, I put it into the, I put it into the application to Northwestern. So it wasn't like happenstance, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I was, you know, definitely trying to build on that legacy, use his archives and all of that. But uh but yeah, it definitely feels good um, and get a lot of support here for that. Um, Beautiful. Oh, for those of you who are at CSUN, uh, uh, our librarian is his canopy. Obviously we have access canopy. So you will be able to find the, uh, in the public, in the, is it in the library or in our library or in the public library, Isabel? Uh, you know, I, that's why I put both up. It's possible that we may have it through Canopy via the streaming database subscription to Canopy. Uh, and if it's not, the Los Angeles Public Library has a much broader subscription to Canopy, uh, lapl.org. And if you don't already have a, uh, a library card with LAPL, you can register for one electronically and that will give you access to their databases and checking books out and all that stuff. So that's another option too. So if we don't have it then, it's likely LAPL will have access to it. Let me see. I just lo I just uh, lost all the questions. And before, I think Sean Hill had a had a, a, a comment, right? You were you were saying, Sean. Uh, um, yeah. It's this uh, Afro Colombian here who's been to Malawi, Nepal, and Mexico. Definitely here to listen. Um, cool. Thanks for, thanks for coming, Sean. Um, I don't see, oh, there's a question here by Kelly De Leon. It says, thinking about abolition in a global sense, how are these communities mentioned uh, creating uh, life sustaining institutions without relying on the state and police? I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, I, have, I mean, yeah. in my presentation, I gave like really like concrete examples on how, because that's what I was interested in, right? How they're like creating life to a state that constantly is reproducing violence, uh, including police, army, as Jason said, like this region, especially around the, the Chacawa Lagoons, there were many days where I would go on the road to the to the community and there was army like asking us to stop the car and revising each car and each of us so in in this context of institutional state violence and narco all these women all the actions that i was describing like mutual aid initiatives taking care of the lagoons by their own like uh, with their own resources creating alternative economies these are all practices of uh, producing life outside of the state and outside even of the capital system because they're like reproducing like more local economies, more local like uh, resources. So I feel that these practices are actually like 
exemplary for many of us, right? How can we create community, mutual aid initiatives, taking care of non-human beings in our everyday life? Uh, I feel that they have a lot of answers to these questions. To, to follow up on that, um, I would say also, um, Costa Chica and the Costa, um, Costa Grande came together in 1959 to be the first agricultural producers to sell their agricultural product directly to another country without um, uh, the state intermediary or some type of hoarder. So something that's really tough for agricultural producers in remote areas is how do you store things in order to sell them without them perishing. This is actually why drugs go so well in the coast because drugs, you refine them, you put them away in your closet and you wait until the trafficker comes to pick them up. It's not like a strawberry, right? A strawberry, you have to rush it to the market. You're beholden to the hoarder, you know, the, the what in, in Spanish is the acaparadore, right? That, 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 right. Buys the, that buys the crop and then takes it to Mexico City or takes it to Chilpancingo or takes it to Acapulco, right? So one of the big things of with, I think, that, that a lot of communities have, have historically tried to do is create their own storage facilities that like, you know, that aren't relied on, relying on chemicals, right? That also, like, also maintain a good storage facility also depends on what you're storing, right? Like, you know, if you're storing something like coconuts for your community, it's easier to store than wheat, you know, wheat doesn't save well on the coast and you're gonna have to be reliant on chemicals. You have to be reliant on hoarders. You'll be relying on the state, right? So that's something that, and you see, you know, six, seven years after um, Costa Chicans and Costa Grande, you know, came together to, 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 to have this huge cocotero movement, right? They were shot down in the streets of Acapulco for, for basically changing the political economy of the coast around coconuts. And that was one of the major things just along the lines, you know, similar with the coffee movement, similar with the 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 the, 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 the wood movement, the timber movement, that basically was the copreros, the you know the cafetaleros, and the you know the the limber folks who were they weren't they weren't cutting down trees, they were fighting against forestry, right? That came together and they were the base of Lucio Cabanas's Partido de los Pobres, right? So I think that like looking at how communities actually grow things, save things, sell things is what's always been really fundamental about when people pick up guns and go into the Sierra, right? Or when they, you know, figure out ways to sell things on their own. Cause that's the one big problem is like, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I'm not trying to say they need it to, you know, not, you know, to get beyond monoculture is, is very important, right? To, to get beyond just growing these gigantic plantations, right? But still, they're still gonna, they're still gonna be growing things that are gonna be plugged into an urbanizing capitalist economy. And they're still always gonna be beholden to that even if they're not beholden to the state. So how do they create wealth but then also, I don't like romantic ideas that don't want to integrate particular communities into other, you know, you know, possibilities and just say, oh, they should just grow what they want there and not think about, you know, bringing on new types of things, right? Like, I think that's just a, that's just not the way to do it. But I think it's, just, it's very complicated. It's very complicated, especially as in a grand society, it always starts with what is grown, for whom, and for what, right? Um, and I do think that that really ties into some of the earlier waves of what Yoel is talking about now, you know, the, you know, because the, the social movements who, you know, have, have, have run Guerrero's coast, you know, since Juan Alvarez and Vicente Guerrero have always been tied. I mean, Juan Alvarez really, he actually started the first coconut plantations in the 1860s, right? So these all go back to, the, to those histories. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, Yoali. Uh, my colleague Keith Rice asked me, but he didn't put it in the in the general chat. If if I've already asked you about um, what triggered your interest in uh, in the case of Yoali, is just uh, this region, right? In particular, and in the case of Jason, is is broader, is Latin America, and it's Mexico in particular, right? Mexico and the U.S. W what trigger your academic interest on on all these? So in my case, uh, since I was doing my bachelor's degree, I was working with uh, issues on racism and sexism. For my bachelor's degree, I did my anthropology uh, thesis on, I did my field work inside of a prison in Puebla. And I was working with indigenous women inside the prison. And I was trying to document how uh, 
institutional and juridical racism come into play when the justice is happening towards indigenous people, particularly women that were in prison because of uh, narco traffic. Mm -hmm. And then for my master thesis, I work with racism and xenophobia in the southern border of Guatemala and Mexico. So I was working with human rights violation towards Central American women and xenophobia in Mexico towards uh, migrants. So for my dissertation, I was working also, I was like, okay, I want to keep working on racism, like an intersectional analysis. And I was like, oh, okay, and working at UT Austin with many of my professors, um, it was like, okay, Costa Chica. And then I had some friends from there. And then I went to Costa Chica. And because it's a collaborative work, that's something that I didn't say, is that since the beginning, even when I was like designing my project, aside from just going and, and just starting my field work. I went one summer before I presented my work to the community and to the women and they made the observations, the corrections. So then I came back to Austin, I changed my, my project. And then the next year I went with the project with their observations. So it has been all, all my projects since the beginning a collaboration with women in the community and that's how it started. That's beautiful, thank you. Jason. Yeah, so so me, my my kind of path to studying Mexican environmental history has to do with kind of being a peripatetic. I moved a lot as a kid. I moved 10 times before 10 when I was 10. I moved to Tucson, Arizona. And uh, I my best friend's father was a was a merchant, a vegetable merchant in Nogales. Um, he I've interviewed him for my my thesis. So some of the first uh, cotton plantations that I ever saw were in Bigsby in, in, in Douglas on the border of US and Mexico near, near Sonora, near Nogales, when I was a soccer player um, in Arizona. And then I moved to Mississippi um, and I saw cotton plantations there, but also saw the rise of Mexican populations in the South. And I saw just kind of shared struggles around agriculture, agricultural labor, just the kind of the, the dehumanization of agricultural labor in both countries both from like the enslaved experience in the United States tied to cotton, but also looking at kind of the history um, Mexico as well. So the thing that finally tied it together was I studied I studied um, history and philosophy and environmental sciences in, in Millsaps in Mississippi, and they have connections to a bioreserve in Yucatan. So I actually spent a lot of time as an undergrad in Yucatan testing water contamination levels in, in Yucatec Pueblas, um, very south of Merida, places where there's very little Spanish um, and I keep on going back to these communities. I, I do work with the Ititarios there. We have a literacy camps, very tied with, uh, with them still. But I started, I saw there between 2010 and 2013, 14, kind of the impact of, uh, the impact of Cancun and the impact of the rise in tourism and Merida had on little communities um, in the Puk region of Yucatan. And it was at that time that Matthew Ressal was putting out his research on Afro-Yucatecans and the Campeche Trail. And, you know, I actually don't really know if I've ever been to Campeche. I've been so deep in some of the junk, the, the forest out there that I think I've been there, but I just started, I, I, I wanted to better understand um, kind of the history between like this colonialism and tourism between the United States and Cancun, but I thought it might start back earlier with Acapulco. And I learned that there was an Afro-Mexican population there. My mother lives in North Carolina, very close to um, Afro-Mexican populations there. So it just kind of fit. Um, so it was in order to you know, keep on asking these questions. So I went to study with somebody who, um, who basically studied the, um, the Hennequin plantation. Like basically Yucatan became the richest state in Mexico by the revolution because of Hennequin fiber. A lot of the Hennequin fiber was actually used to bind cotton in the US South and it was actually bound by um, chattel and chattel um, prison labor, black prison labor in Mississippi and Alabama actually used some of that binder twine. So it was really early thinking connections about like the South, right? So I, it was from a school in Mississippi, I was going to doing water contamination in Yucatan, right? And um, I developed a philosophy for children program in, in Jackson, Mississippi that I actually ended up taking in Chiapas for four years. So I was always thinking about South to South, South to South, South to South. Um, you know, if anybody from Emory or Rice or you know, is listening, that's definitely where I'm trying to head. Um, so, um, 
Um, I, you know, I, I have very political goals in trying to, you know, do organizing work in the U.S. South around Black and Latinx populations, because I think that's the that's the future of this this of the United States is uh, as a U.S. South that just as a we already see the U.S. South isn't red; it's suppressed, right? We know this very much, and I think that if we don't have a good understanding of the the diversity of the Latinx population that's throughout the deltas of Mississippi, you know, the bayous of Louisiana, the urban life of New Orleans and Atlanta, we're not going to have good good solidarity, good community organizing fronts to change the Southern politics that's going to change in the next 10, 15 years, 100%. So that's that was the goal, was really growing up in the South, right? Tucson, Mississippi. And I was just like, this is the future. You know, this is the future. Thank you so much, Jason. I think you, you make a really wonderful point. Um, wonderful points, I think not only one. I wish we can capture you and then just get you at Nordridge, but evidently maybe maybe this is not we cannot afford you. We you might be <laughs> that is certainly not true. That's certainly it's not, not true. true. Then we'll we then we will try to get you here. <laughs> you know, get the paperwork going. I graduate 2022. Um, That's no. good. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop because I don't want to abuse all we do have members. one last I do we I do see we have a question. Oh, do you have um, a, do Luis you... Moreno, who I know is currently in Costa Chica. Okay. And I, it, it, it was at 314. Do you guys see the question? At one for yes. I see that it's, it's not really okay, a question. It's, it's, more, it's, it's more, a more like a comment. Oh, sorry. I didn't get to, I didn't get to read it yet. You, you Lisa, Ulises, why don't fine. you, why don't you, why don't you say it? Hi, so yes, I'm actually living in Costa Chica. I'm from Costa Grande, uh, but I live here doing research. Um, so I just wanted to point out the inverse relationship uh, or, or the flip side of what Jason is mentioning. Uh, so much of what, what what is produced here goes does go to urban metropolis, <clears throat> or metropolis, uh, but also uh, sometimes it goes out there and then it comes back here and it's sold to us in uh, much larger prices than locally um, locally produced. Uh, so there's some stuff that's produced here as well, but the, I guess, broader point that I was trying to make here is that um, we don't produce as much as we should. Uh, out of consumption, uh, the capabilities for outer consumptions are much larger and some of it, it's not that it goes away. Um, it's just that the kinds of programs that the, that the government has uh, uh, sponsored caused a lot of damage. And so uh, that, that goes along with the narrative of being dependent upon cities like Puebla, which bring in a lot of the produce to be sold here at much more expensive rates. Right, right. Prices. Can I respond? I, I, that's, I, that's a fabulous, fabulous point. The one, the thing I would say is, well, one, I definitely am looking at like pre-NAFTA, right? Which is a very, very different context, right? But then also, I 100% agree. And that's why I think looking at the, looking at Mexican processed food industry, and looking at the food industry in Mexico, just like we look at it in the United States, we look at Procter & Gamble, Monsanto, Cargill, you know, in a similar way, the Mexican food industry is always processing value into agriculture away from the community itself. So if you think about the most, one of the most profitable commodities in Sinaloa, I don't know about Guerrero, is potatoes. And, and none of that money goes back to the community until they're expected to buy potato chips once they're processed into potato chips and sold back to the community, right? So thinking about like the OXO effect, right? Like how, how so many different products that come from the oil seeds produced in Costa Grande and Costa Chica are, are rendered fungible into products you don't even recognize, right? Before then they're brought back to the community, right? So that process I think has been happening since Lazaro Cardenas, unfortunately, right? You know, not to not to throw shade, but it just it just is it is what it is, you know. And but I think you're absolutely right that. But I just didn't want to. That's such a tough argument. And as someone who's not from the coast, doesn't live in the coast, you know, to say that a place needs to develop more or needs to develop less. That's just that you know I I completely defer to Yoeli and it needs to be community led, right? You know, um, it you you know you know so. But I, I completely agree with with you, with you in the sense that. 
they're not producing enough. The self-sufficiency is not there because they're completely dependent on the industrialization of the food industry, right? The internationalization of the food industry, which ultimately is always undermining the local space, always. Yeah. Yes, and just to clarify, my argument or my point isn't to advocate for what you just mentioned in terms of industrial kind of production, or even say that we aren't here. It's just that there are efforts. Um, even the federal government at the moment has uh, a program that they used to call Bronize, and now it's called Inais. Uh, they incentivize through higher education, uh, local cooperatives, and also um, basically cooperative living. And so these are very limited though. And there's a flip side in terms of what the government says, and what they do, because they're not funding these programs. They're just, it's sort of, a, a sh if you want a, a curtain for the mega projects in Oaxaca, including where Metsi, uh, perdón, <laughs> where Yoali is working uh, in terms of the dam, the water dam that they were trying to build uh, and they're trying to revive that project so as to head down to the uh, Lagunas de Chacawa. Um, so it all sort of interconnects and there's a lot of hypocrisy with the current administration. I think that's important to point out in this broader conversation, particularly because from the US, uh, everything is seen as, oh, leftist government, AMLO, brilliant. And it's not the case, right? There's a lot of critique that's undergirded that needs to be highlighted and work that you all are doing, I think is fantastic. The ghost that speaks to that historically and contemporary politics that are necessary to point out. I'm trying to mute this now. I'm, I'm muted. I muted myself. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks so much for your participation. Uh, thanks for, for contributing to this conversation. I, I think I'm going to leave it there at this point so we don't abuse these folks. Uh, times against, I think, everybody that, that spent some time with us. Uh, we're hoping to tape the panel, not the movie, by the movie uh, of Ebony. Uh, so you, you guys will be able to, um, uh, to watch it in, in case you want to uh, sort of learn more calmly what mo uh, the major points that um, the panelists were, were presenting to us. On behalf of the Bradley Center and obviously the California State University Nordridge, which we're hoping we can get these wonderful scholars here at Nordridge somehow, some some way, let's figure it out if we can get you in uh, at Nordridge. Uh, I'm very excited for the work you do. I'm really thankful for all the work that you guys are doing. Ebony obviously is a media maker, right, which is very important for people to know what's going on and her documentary is really uh, unique. And I'm hoping that she will continue exploring these kinds of issues, right? It's hard to be a, a documentary filmmaker, especially an independent one. So you need funding and you have the time you need to apply for damn grants, et cetera, just to get some money rolling so you can do uh, your work. So I'm hoping that we will be able to serve also as a resource for her and also for Jason and, and Yuali, in case you wanna pursue uh, something else that we are connected with, right? Uh, thank you so much. And, and, and thanks all, all of you for tuning in. Thank you.